Hello and welcome to Stories of Scotland, a podcast where we find wonderful and weird tales from Scottish history. I'm Jenny. And I'm Annie. And today we're talking about the Magical War of 1820. I'll get my cannons ready. Actually, it's, it's not really a war like that, Jenny. It's more of a kind of civil unrest. Okay, well, I'll get my guillotines ready. Oh. Nope. Okay, well, it is a misleading name, all right? But as we all know, that's just how things were back in the 1820s, which is also known as the 19th century. Jenny. I, I rest my case. How need I say more, you know? Well, either way, we're now coming up to the 200-year anniversary of the unrest, and so we thought it would be fitting to take a look back at the most radical of not-quite-wars. It is, and I'm really interested in what we can learn about the civil disobedience of the past and how we can apply these lessons to the modern day, especially as we face problems like the climate crisis. So you might be thinking, how can the radical war be relevant to the environmental crisis? Yep, yep, that's, that's what I was thinking right there. Hi, Annie, tell me. Well, first, <laughs> <laughs> firstly, it features normal people using power of protest to demand a political change. Uh-huh. Secondly, the 1820s was the maturing of the first industrial revolution. So we've got machines replacing manpower in industries, especially weaving. And it's during this first industrial revolution that we see the birth of environmental movements. For the first time, people became concerned about the pollution being caused by human activity. And I feel on top of that, maybe it's just me, but it does feel like we're in a very politically unstable time. So this seems like a good time to be talking about the radical wars of the past and seeing how we can make some changes for the future. Anyway, so this so-called radical war was at least radical, right? Well, I guess it depends on how you define radical. A lot of the issues that caused the uprising were things that we would probably be quite angry about today. There were over 2 million people in Scotland. Only 0.2% of people had the vote. For the 1820 radical war, some of the political demands were very, very radical. But it was mostly everyday people who were broken by high taxes and an authoritarian government, and they were just trying to claim back some power for themselves. We have a time where a large amount of people were disillusioned because they couldn't vote, they didn't have a strong political voice, but technology and international politics were quickly transforming their lives. Mm, And there's definitely a lot of parallels with what you just said and today, really. Um, But that's kind of all of Europe around that time, right? Yes, Europe was very restless. For example, what's your favourite revolution? Ah, vive la revolution! (laughs) Big, big fan of the French Revolution here, uh, mainly for its use of the guillotine. It all started in 1789. The French monarchy was in massive amounts of debt and started taxing the population heavily. This, along with many other things, kicked off one of the most important revolutions in history. Essentially, it was the majority of the French population, anyone who wasn't the wealthiest or the most powerful tier in society, rising up against a minority feudal monarchy. It resulted in a huge dynastic monarchy being overthrown, and for the first time ever, it was not replaced with another monarchy. It paved the way for modern society as we know it, and also the guillotine. Whoa, put down the guillotine, Jenny. Never. And let's think about what's happening in the Highlands at the same time. Right, yeah, so this is the late 18th century. It's the midst of the Highland clearances. Wealthy landowners are forcing people to leave land that they have lived on and worked for countless generations to make way for sheep. These families were cleared from their ancestral homes and had no choice but to move to the Central Belt or emigrate. In some cases, they were even burnt out of their homes. Uh, Yeah, the Highlanders were being forced from their homes down into the cities, which were not prepared for this massive influx of people. This caused mass overcrowding and social upheaval. The general population, both Highlanders and urban folk, were left incredibly angry and disillusioned with the government. Yes, so this, combined with social conditions and the loss of jobs from the Industrial Revolution, has made people very restless. Mm. And with the French Revolution just behind us, the British government is getting very nervous that something similar could happen here. So they're very cautious about radical movements starting. And so to maintain control, power and wealth, the British government started to work really hard to stamp out any radical demands for parliamentary reform in the United Kingdom. The French Revolution really wasn't great for France's international relationships and it ignited the Napoleonic Wars, which were fought until 1815, so almost 30 years after the French Revolution had started. Fighting Napoleon cost the British government a lot of cash and caused a massive economic downturn. People were getting restless with the deteriorating status quo. So, for context to the radical war in Scotland, in 
1819, Britain has just borne witness to the massacre of Peterloo. Vive le Peterloo! But yeah, no, this was a bad one. Uh, by 1819, people were expecting life to be improving after the Napoleonic Wars. With fighting in Europe over, importing foodstuffs from abroad was becoming easier and cheaper, so people were expecting the cost of living to decrease and therefore quality of life to increase. The government, however, was not feeling this. They began imposing heavy taxes on imported corn, keeping the price of the basic necessity high. This was because it was profitable for domestic landowners whom were in the aristocracy. This enraged the everyday people who were in the grips of poverty and famine. Aye, bread is a vital food source for people. So in time of hardship, the higher prices of bread are really going to impact society, and especially those living in poverty. Yeah, and because of this, protests were happening up and down the country. And on the 16th of August, 1819, over 60,000 people gathered in St. Peter's Field in the centre of Manchester for a peaceful protest. This was against the Corn Laws and many other injustices. Feeling threatened, the local council deployed mounted cavalry and soldiers against the crowds. They charged into the mass of unsuspecting people, causing mass carnage and destruction. Overall, 18 people were killed and over 600 were seriously injured. The nation was shocked by the actions of the government and the Peterloo massacre further fueled anger and unrest throughout Britain. The radical fires were burning. But the government's response to Peterloo was to bring in the infamous Six Acts. These were gagging acts which restricted free speech and the right to assemble. These were definitely not welcomed by the people and pushed radical behaviour underground. But Scotland is brilliant at civil unrest. And one of the curious ways that people would object to the Corn Laws was to riot on the king's birthday. Oh, what a lovely present. Did the riot have a bow on top? (laughs) (laughs) Well, the most famous of these was a three-day riot sesh on the King's birthday in Edinburgh in 1792. Yes. And Wait, this was... you, you know that actually just developed into the fringe? <laughs> <laughs> it's still going. The party never ended. <laughs> the riot never ended, Jenny. <laughs> yes, you're right. In our hearts, anyway. <laughs> but this was direct response to the first coin laws. However, we see these King's birthday riots continuing in Glasgow both before and after the Radical War. Birthday riots. I've always wanted a riot for my birthday. (laughs) But at this time, the government was trying to quash out any and all people who wanted radical reform of parliament. They went to great lengths to enforce these acts. In my hometown of Paisley, actually, there was a march in 1819 where they were, it was peaceful, and they were just walking along singing the unofficial national anthem of the country at the time, which was Scots Wahey, written by Burns. And it was about rising up and fighting for freedom. The band playing the songs were actually arrested and locked up just for playing the music, but this resulted in it becoming hummed and whistled all over the town afterwards as a sort of underlying form of resistance. So yeah, vive le Paisley! Vive le Paisley! Always said it. What's really fascinating about the 1820 Radical War is that the government used a network of sneaky, treacherous, covert spies, agent provocateurs, to keep track on all radical activity. The radicals had a lot to fear from government spies and informers. I mean, at the start of 1820, the British government had just caught the Cato Street conspirators. Yeah, so that's when a group of 13 men who called themselves the Spencean Philanthropists plotted to kill every single cabinet member and the prime minister in order to kickstart a radical revolution. However, they were foiled by one of their own leaders who'd been a government spy all along. And in very close timing to the Cato Street, a committee of 28 men were arrested in Glasgow for holding a radical meeting. So the government was keeping a very watchful eye on radical behaviour and also using the caught and convicted conspirators as justification to their authoritarian grip on the nation. Okay, so now we're back over the Scottish border. There's loads of unrest and anger bubbling up. The government is starting to panic. I think it's time we start a radical war. Well, on the 1st of April, 1820... (laughs) Some would say that's a foolish day to start a revolution. Jokers, a lot of them. Och, wish Jenny. <laughs> On the 1st of April, 1820, posters appeared across Glasgow, Paisley, Dumbarton and Kilsyth. 
calling for workers to strike in order to overthrow the government. Oh. So this radical sway is coming from the working classes, highly skilled tradespeople, people with arts and crafts that have been passed down through generations of their families who are losing their livelihoods to machines. People are seeing the price of their daily bread inflated, but they're seeing their salaries go down. So Jenny, can you do the accent of a central belt artisan weaver? You're about to declare a new dawn for the rights of everyday people. <clears throat> All right. Friends and countrymen, rouse from that torpid state in which we have been sunk for so many years. We are at length compelled from the extremity of our sufferings to assert our rights at the hazards of our lives. So you've been in hardship for too long. You know your rights and you're willing to die for them. Our principles are few and founded on the basis of our constitution, which was purchased with the dearest blood of our ancestors and which we swear to transmit posterity unsullied or perish in the attempt. Equality of rights, not of property, is the object for which we contend and which we consider as the only security for our liberty and lives. Let us show to the world that we are not the lawless rabble which our oppressors would persuade the higher circles that we are, but a brave and generous people determined to be free. Liberty or death is our motto, and we have sworn to return home in triumph or return no more. By order of the Committee of Reformation, the forming of a provisional government. Congratulations. You've just declared your own parliament. If your momentum is stopped now, then you will be charged with treason. Ooh, how thrilling. <laughs> and the posters worked. On 3rd of April, 1820, 60,000 people from all over the industrial central belt of Scotland put down their tools, stopped working and went on strike. Groups of men even partook in military training, which is breaking the six acts, thus illegal. Now, we have small groups of radicals getting into skirmishes and troubles in different parts of the central belt, the most famous of these groups being the Battle of Bonnie Muir. But like the so-called radical war, this isn't a real battle, is it? Okay, it's a wee bit of a story, Jenny. All right, Two here we weavers, go. who had also served in the military, Andrew Hardy and John Baird, led a party of about 40 men to raid the Carron Ironworks to seize the weapons. Nice. However, when they reached Bonnie Muir, they were confronted by military and realised they were totally outnumbered, outhorsed and outweaponed by the government forces. Okay, but what I read for this, that it was actually a government spy that was driving the uprising towards Bonnie Muir, knowing that the government cavalry lay in wait. Yes, there's a popular belief that spies hidden within the radical groups were encouraging the radicals, trying to smoke them out and get the real leaders to stick up their heads so that the government could chop them off. Jeez. It... Could have been a bit of a setup by the British government spies to bring the radical leaders out of the shadows and into the gallows. God, that's a bit grisly, isn't it? But there were weapons at Bonnie Muir as well, right? Yes, pikes and pistols. However, it was a very unbalanced fight. Some of the radicals fought and were wounded and taken prisoner, and others ran. Eighteen prisoners in total were taken, including Hardy and Baird. But I love the radicals in Strathaven. They seized all the weapons in their town and took control of the village. Yes. And then the next evening, there was supposed to be an uprising in Glasgow, but not enough people turned up. Oh, that's what happens when you don't have Twitter. A weaver called James Wilson led the Strathaven march with a banner which read, Scotland, free or desert? which I think is a very old reference to the battle speech made to the tribal Scots before they met Roman soldiers, which proclaimed that Scotland was the last of the free from Roman occupation, stating the Romans created a desolation, a desert, and they called it peace. Anyway, poor James led about 25 men towards Glasgow, but received the intelligence of an ambush lying in wait. They avoided this, but ended up dispersing when they had no radical army to join. However, the authorities had managed to get the names of the key leaders of this group, including James Wilson, and they were quickly thrown in jail. So the radical war was really just a few skirmishes and people giving up on the rebellion because not enough people turned up? Well, 
60,000 people going on strike is not insignificant. This amount of the workforce is going to put industries at a standstill. So, the bloodiest day of the radical war is actually after the war is over. On April 8th, after the rebellion has been truly quashed, 120 men from the Voluntary Port Glasgow Armed Association were ordered to take the prisoners from Paisley to Greenock. However, a crowd broke into the jail and tried to set the rebels free. Yeah. They released five of them. However, the price they paid for this was very high. Mm. The armed guards shot into the crowd indiscriminately. <sighs> Opening fire, the army killed eight people and injured ten. Amongst the casualties was an eight-year-old boy. Oh, that's tragic, you know, and all for the right to vote. Because of their involvement in the radical war, in total, 88 men were charged with high treason. Of these, 19 men were sent to Australia as part of the penal transportations which took place until the mid-1800s. Most were sent for about 15 years, but seven were given transportation for life, meaning that they would never be allowed to return home. All men were granted a full pardon by King William IV in 1935, but many had established themselves in Australia and were doing well, so just decided to stay. And some of these guys went on to live really nice lives. My favourite is a guy called John Anderson. He was described as a quiet, conscientious man with a small left eye. He was aged 27 at the time of Bonnemuir. After arriving in Australia, the former weaver, also remembered for his good singing voice, became a teacher of the Presbyterian School at Portland Head. But the leaders weren't so lucky. The judge made it known to them that they wouldn't be given any mercy because they had incited the whole rebellion. Four of the leaders, Andrew Hardy, John Baird, James Wilson and James Cleland, were sentenced to death. Cleland was transported instead. After the hanging of James Wilson, Andrew Hardy and John Baird, who were only 27 and 31 respectively, were hanged and beheaded at Stirling Castle. A crowd of people gathered in the square, some watching for entertainment, but the majority were there to show solidarity. The men were led into the square and read passages from the Bible. When they stepped up to the scaffolding so that all could see, they each said their last words. Baird proclaimed, I die a martyr to the cause of truth and justice. The crowd stayed mainly silent, but those who did cheer quickly scattered so as not to be arrested themselves. The men were hung. After 25 minutes, the bodies were taken down and the executioner proceeded to chop off their heads, just to be sure. He then held up each head and proclaimed, This is the head of a traitor! They were the last two beheadings to be carried out in the UK. So that's a very strong message to send to the radicals who did avoid capture. There's actually a memorial to Hardy and Baird in Glasgow that has a lovely inscription. Jenny? Our heath-clad hills and lonely mountain caves are marked by battlefields and martyrs' graves. This stone records the last embattled stroke which Scotsmen struck at vile oppressors' yoke. At Bonnemure they trod their native heath and sought a warrior's or a martyr's death. Sad choice, for there they found their enterprise to claim or force reform by armed surprise. Alas, circumvented and betrayed by spies and thus ensnared in treason's feudal laws, their personal honour, the people's cause, compelled to fight which claims our pity and applause. So the radical war wasn't anything like a military war. It was a war of ideas and what is fair and right. It was a radical uprising because working people were rising up against their oppressors demanding the right of democracy that we have today. And we don't see change happening overnight, but the deaths and transportations couldn't hold back the revolution. Yes, Peter Lou, the radical war, the uprising of the working classes pushed through multiple reform bills, starting with the Representation of the People Act, 1832. 
So the Representation of the People Acts are the acts which are widening the right to vote to different groups of people, increasing suffrage. The 1832 Act had been pushed through because there had been riots when the Reform Bill had been rejected in 1831. The Tories in the House of Lords had struck it down and angered people had taken to the streets. And these riots scared the government a lot. They feared that if there was no reform, there would be a revolution instead. Yes, so the government wasn't acting for the good of the people. They were watching their own backs, as well as the king, whose popularity was plummeting. Mm. The Representation Act allowed men who owned property worth over £10 to vote, which did cut out most of the working classes. However, this was a stepping stone on the road to universal suffrage. And that continued throughout the following centuries, a key milestone being the 1918 Act, which gave some women over the age of 30 the right to vote. This was changed to be in line with the rights of men in 1928. And the early 1800s uprising helped create a platform for women to stand on when they began to demand the vote. We see with the radical war that change did happen, but it took a really long time. Change isn't overnight or the result of one big action. It's built up on tiny actions, little steps, building blocks. And we are all ultimately responsible for putting those blocks in place. Because if we don't, then who will? Yes, you have to fight for what you believe in and Mm. what you care about. Just like the weavers of Paisley. Yes, just like the weavers of Paisley. So around the time of the Radical War, we saw the rise of environmental movements, people being aware of the human-made damage to the environment and wanting this to change. This is because in the Industrial Revolution, factory fumes were causing air pollution in cities and causing dreadful health issues. So the Radical War was fought for the right to vote. It was weavers and artisans, skilled working-class people angry that machines were taking their jobs and lowering their salaries. And now we're living in a time when highly industrialised countries are enabling us to produce, manufacture, consume and dispose of too much and that's really damaging our environment. So maybe what we need to do now is to go back to a time where we encourage, buy and treasure traditional crafts and so shun the culture of cheap disposable products Bring back the radical weavers, I say. Yes, more weavers. And I think the way we resist this disposable culture is to look at what progress means for us. Progress doesn't mean that we have to live in a world made more mechanical until we all live in spaceships. Progress could mean thinking more about making small ethical choices that could involve traditions that are centuries of years old. If we have a radical war in the modern day, it has to be the climate crisis. I guess the 1820 radical war reminds us that collective uprisings can make a massive political change. But also, historically, very basic rights that seemed radical at the time turned out to be a cornerstone of democracy. And there's certainly no more desirable right than living on a planet that isn't being irreversibly ruined. Well, we hope you've taken some inspiration from the Radical Wars and that we can all learn something from the struggle of those that fought before us. Thank you so much for listening to Stories of Scotland. If you've enjoyed the show, then please like and subscribe. Leave us a rating. It really does help us. It gives my life meaning, Annie. But uh, yeah, follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Give us a like and a share on Facebook. And until next week, slanjava. Slanjava.